Um, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Justin Adams, who um, has literally just left BP. Um, within BP over the last eight, nine years or so, he was an entrepreneur um, within the belly of the beast. He basically tried to push for clean technology and innovation um, towards a sustainable future within what we all know to be um, a very complicated organization and situation. So Justin's gonna share his perspective on what that journey was like. Thank you, Colin. Uh, good afternoon, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm gonna talk uh, this afternoon about reframing the energy debate and, uh, and giving a slightly different perspective. But I wanna start, particularly in the after lunch slot, just a little bit of audience participation. So just shout out, you know, just a few of you shout out, the first words that come to mind when you think of the oil industry. Okay, so pollution, dirty, unsustainable. Okay, so next question. Uh, first words that come to mind when you think of the renewable industry. Small, small, small clean, nice. Okay. Oh, I didn't change, sorry. That's, that's supposed to be the backdrop. So, so it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's obviously a, a, a little bit of a stunt, but what I want to point out is that our frame of reference is everything and how it's not just about what I say, but also about how you listen, and where we draw the boundaries around the frame for this conversation, indeed the whole conversation that we're having today, will actually determine kind of where the solution set may exist. So if we draw the boundaries too small, perhaps we actually exclude some of the solutions that we're actually searching for. And it's very human nature to actually carve up our reality into a more simple sort of two-part <laughs> Uh, two-part reality, so good and bad, right and wrong, that's things that we learn from a very, very early age, and we ingrain that, and we have this dualistic world, so winning and losing. Um, but if you step back and you look at even a basic dualism like night and day, you step back farther enough, then night and day obviously all just merges into one, it depends where you stand on the planet, and things like that. So that it's actually all part of a continuum. And so in psychology terms, what a lot of I want to talk about is actually how do we collapse these dualisms so we're not making something right and something wrong, but we're actually finding where's, where's the common ground and where actually might some solutions sit. So to talk about any frame of reference, uh, it's a, it's our own frames of reference are the product of the experiences that we've been on. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a snapshot about my own journey through life and how I've got to where I am today so you understand my frame of reference as I'm talking to you. So I was the son of a, uh, the son of a visionary, successful entrepreneur, and from the earliest age, business was the only thing I ever thought about doing. That was, that was my path. In my early 20s, actually, at university, studying business, there was a sort of course that threw all of that up in the air and said, you know, business is the source of a lot of the problems and the environmental destruction. And so that started awaking a sort of deep spiritual yearning and a spiritual pathway that then sort of led me to sort of a growing environmental awareness and some real challenges. So here's a picture of me. This is my Casper moment uh, back in my uh, <laughs> early 20s, learning to play the didgeridoo. And uh, here's a picture of me 20 years on with... Uh, with uh, uh, my sort of business attire on uh, as a BP executive. And, you know, and, and, but for the first few years of my 20s, I had this real schizophrenia going on where there were these two completely different parts of my personality, one sort of this environmentalist and sort of a spiritual yearning, and the other, this guy driving around sort of doing, uh, actually working in sustainable transportation solutions at the time, trying to find some, some sort of things that we could, uh, of, of, of how we could sort of move that product forward. But this, this schism, was kind of tearing me apart. And then I suddenly realized I had to find a way of integrating these two parts of myself. And I wonder how many of us, how many people inside giant corporates have got sort of that inner passion around kind of what was some of that idealistic, you know, what they wanted to do as a youth that they somehow lose, according to Casper, when we get past 25 and suddenly we become old, then you know, how, how does that, now, how do we actually bridge these divides? And that was really the struggle I had. And the path that, that, was, that was there for me was actually to say, I have to work in business, but I have to find a way of how business can be a force for good 
and business can actually be creating the solutions rather than be part of the problem. And that's the path that I've been on for the last uh, 15 to 20 years in my career as an entrepreneur, as a consultant, and for the last 10 years, what better place to do that but actually inside one of these giant corporations. And uh, you know, I joined BP in 2003 and so I've had the best part of a decade working in this, uh, this giant organization. So that's been a big part of my story and that's where I'm coming from as I sort of now talk about the solutions that, 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 I, that I think are out there. So let me just first touch on sort of where are we in, in, in energy. And I think as I went into the energy sector, I started working in energy uh, back in 97. But as I went into that, there was this expectation that actually we could transform these giant oil companies. They could become more integrated energy companies. They were going to drive the transformation to renewables. And in fact, I think what we did is we created this sort of dialogue, again, this dualism, which meant that sort of renewables was good and oil and gas was bad, very much as we discussed earlier. And that wasn't actually the way that we could engage, so that there was this whole flurry of activity. And all of the majors have now got renewables renewable activities of one kind and another, but the bid to actually transform these companies was really a little bit too idealistic. The stretch was just too far from where these companies were today, however good the intent. And so sort of living with a slogan of beyond petroleum yeah, and what that set up in terms of society, that just put expectations too far out for actually what an oil and gas major could deliver. Uh, at that time. So, you know, part of my role has been living with this sort of world of renewables and oil and gas and how can you actually sort of bring them together as well as, you know, this, so this collapsing of dualisms that I talked about, renewables versus oil and gas, uh, the incumbents versus the entrepreneurs and my own sort of spiritual yearning and the material parts of my life, how do I bring them together? So as I step out of energy, you know, I realize it's significantly more uh, complex than I had ever thought sort of 10 or 15 years ago. And there are some, some key takeouts, four key takeouts that I want to just share with you. Firstly, fossil fuels are integral to the modern economy. Okay? We would not be sitting here today without fossil fuels. Fossil fuels represent a huge part of the tax revenue in all developed economies. In the UK, just to take one example, the third largest source of tax revenue for the exchequer after payroll taxes and VAT is fuel tax. You add on top of that, the oil and gas sector pays 20% of corporation tax in the UK, you start to get a feeling for just how entangled this system is. And that's before we even start looking at the sort of shareholder side of it and dividends and things that are paid. If, you, if we're interested in our frame of sustainability, not just about the climate debate and, and, and carbon, but actually about global poverty and development, fossil fuels have driven China's economic miracle that Colin referred to, but fossil fuels have driven that that's pulled 500 million people out of poverty. Now, there are some environmental consequences of that, but from a human perspective, bringing those people out of poverty, giving them a quality of life, is not something that we can immediately make wrong. So I'm not just trying to defend oil and gas for the sake of defending oil and gas, but just so we understand how integral it is to all of our lives in a modern economy. I'm also very aware of the darker sides of that, having lived through the Gulf of Mexico tragedy that BP, um, was, uh, with, uh, that, that BP had a couple of years ago. If I move on to my second point, though, renewables are... A, 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 an increasingly important part of the energy mix. They are the fastest growing part of the energy mix globally. For the last few years, costs have tumbled. 75% um, reductions in solar over the last few years that's making it a more and more affordable solution. So renewables are a fantastic part of the energy mix, but today they only represent 2.8% of final energy consumption. And that's after 10 years of tremendous growth and tremendous support to develop these industries. So I'm not saying stop that. I absolutely want to see that continue. But we've got to recognize today they're a small part of the total solution. The third point is about innovation. And that's that in every sector, incumbents time and time again have been shown to not be able to create the transformative on the whole, not been able to create the transformative change to move into new paradigms, whether we're talking about personal computers, we're talking about the internet, we're talking about biotech, social media. It's the small entrepreneurial mindset, the freedom that comes actually from being entrepreneurial that is very difficult to create inside a giant organization. There are lots of limits to change. And part of the 
challenge or part of the, uh, the challenges we didn't foresee in the sustainability movement overall was that oil and gas was not going to transform from being an oil and gas sector overnight. It was going to take many, many decades and that actually these companies are going to be oil and gas companies and there's an awful lot that can be done to make those companies more efficient. But let's not look for the transformation to come from within these sectors themselves. They will continue to do oil and gas for many, many decades out into the future. But this whole debate, to my fourth point, this whole debate has actually largely glanced off the oil and gas sector because if you're told consistently you are the problem, you're a sunset industry, you are unsustainable, how can you engage in a sustainability debate if that's the message that you're constantly told? Fundamentally, your core product is wrong even though it's supplying, you know, billions of consumers around the world on a daily basis, the energy that we all take for granted. Okay, so we have to find a new way of engaging the sector. We have to find different solutions. And so that takes me to, you know, so what might some of those solutions be? I've clearly thought long and hard about kind of how, you know, what does sustainability mean in oil and gas? And this is a great quote about, you know, actually most people are more comfortable with old problems than actually looking for the new solutions. And that's the same, I think, in many, many incumbents. It's the same in society more broadly. So part of the challenge for this room, part of the challenge for this, for this movement more broadly is actually to find new ways of engaging new ways of framing. And one of the things that I think we absolutely have to do is to start to look to say, well, if fossil fuels are going to continue to be used, CO2 is going to continue to go up and CO2 emissions will continue to go up as energy demand, particularly in the emerging economies, will continue to grow. So we've got to start looking at the overall carbon cycle, not just at the emissions piece of this. And that means looking at actually how do we pull more carbon out of the atmosphere. If you give that problem to an engineer in an oil and gas company, they will come up with a solution which means sticking it several thousand meters into the subsurface, into an old uh, oil or gas reservoir, and burying it there. That's called CCS. It's a technology. It's had hundreds of millions of dollars poured into it over the last 10 years, and it's going to be an important part of the solution. But today, it is very, very expensive. It is not going to be deployed at scale. Just so happens, nature designed a solution that was actually probably the most perfected carbon sequestration organism several billion years ago, and that's the, the, the tree. And, uh, and actually, not just the tree, but all of the biomass on the planet absorbs a huge amount of CO2 as part of the global carbon cycle. The soil holds more carbon, twice as much carbon as all of the, uh, the annual emissions from, from, uh, from, from the world's uh, combustion of CO2. So are there ways we can actually start to look for solutions where we are absorbing more CO2 into the biosphere and actually helping not just the carbon problem, but also helping with food security, helping with biodiversity preservation, helping with the water cycle and some of these other things. So it's about taking a more holistic approach. There's one problem with that. The sustainability movement has also made offsetting a dirty word. It's a ticket for you dirty industry to carry on polluting. If we're going to continue with that mindset, we continue to create these schisms between the industry which is looking for its solutions and the, the, the folk who are trying to look at how do you stop deforestation and things. We're still cutting down 13 million hectares of forest a year. That's 25 hectares per minute of every day is being cut down at the same time as we're trying to figure out solutions for how can you scale renewables more quickly. So we've got to start stepping back and seeing the bigger, the bigger picture here and finding a bigger solution. And so I've stepped out of BP to actually start working on this and bringing some companies together in unusual alliances that could start to see if we can actually take a bigger perspective, look at some of these solutions that actually sit between sectors, between the silos that we currently have rather than in one individual sector. Just to conclude, I used to that because I've got to finish. Uh, just to conclude, the, um, uh, I want to just come back to dualisms. And because the dualism, it's not just about the idea, but the profound emotion and feeling that sits behind that idea that creates so many of the problems. So what, how many times do we sit and look at the opposite camp and think of them as both rivals in spirit as well as rivals in thought? How many times do we see and get frustrated at the intransigent positions that we find ourselves in that's currently caused the whole climate debate to stagnate and be paralyzed right now? 
It's time to actually step back and find a broader, a bigger dialogue for how we can actually engage the incumbents, not just in the energy sector but beyond, and recognize their role in taking incremental steps to drive change at the same time as really nurturing entrepreneurs and the innovators of the world to, to create more transformational solutions and then actually bring both of these together because we need both to actually find the solutions. But if we're constantly assured of our own rightness in any dialogue, we're automatically making somebody else wrong. And that may actually rob us of the key to the solution that we're also desperately seeking. Thank you very much.